there's a, a time when the Israelites are lost and wandering, when they set up Moses as a judge. And so they're fractious and squabbling because they don't have the capacity for self-governance, being recently freed slaves who are now lost in this expansive, chaotic wasteland, right? This post-tyrannical domain of confusion, which is what the desert signifies. And so they really try to make Moses into a new pharaoh. And so they set him up as judge. And so they bring all the disputes they can't... Um, reconcile themselves to his attention and ask him to rule. And Moses' father-in-law comes along, a man named Jethro, re-enters the picture. He's a good man, a good foreigner. And he says to Moses, you have to stop doing this because you're going to be reestablished as a new pharaoh. And so you'll have all the problems of the previous tyrant. But also by depriving your people of the necessity of adjudicating their own disputes, you infantilize them and they'll stay as slaves. And so that's a very interesting and cogent critique. And so what Jethro tells Moses to do, this is a very cre a key, uh, what would you call it, occurrence in the history of political thought, because the the issue that's being addressed in a very compact form is, well, what's the alternative to the tyrant and the slave, right? You could think about those as extreme forms of, of social organization, tight organization under the, a single power and no organization whatsoever. And what Jethro tells Moses to do is to divide his people into groups and make a hierarchy. So, Put everybody in groups of 10, have those 10 elect a leader um, from amongst themselves, then to make a group out of those leaders, and then to take the leader leaders and make another pinnacle above them, and to do all the way up, do that all the way up to groups of 10,000, and then to adjudicate the disputes from the bottom up, letting only those that can't be adjudicated at a lower level get to Moses. So it's it's the construction of a hierarchy that's called the principle of subsidiarity. And so it's the formulation of a subsidiary hierarchy of responsibility and identity that's the alternative to the slave and the tyrant. And you're touching on that in your formulation. This is something we've been dealing with formally at this uh, Alliance for Responsible Citizenship organization that's an attempt to bring conservatives and classic liberals together all around the world. And so, you know, you're highlighting certain elements of those, that subsidiary identity, which is not only a belief, right? It's a mode of being in the world. Like to have a family isn't only to believe that a family is valuable. It's also to have a family, right? And to be nested in that. And one of the points that you're making that you appear to be making is that, well, if you're looking for an identity, father, sibling, son in a well-structured nuclear family actually provides that, right? It's it's who you are. It, it shapes the way you see the world. And it, it offers you a set of meaningful responsibilities. But it's not only the nuclear family, right? It's the town, it's the city, it's the state, it's the nation. And so there's a place for the nation as well. You, you know, the problem with the globalist view, which is that it's disenfranchised, hyper-individualistic, um, autonomous individuals bereft of any social structuring, is that you end up with the slave-tyrant problem immediately, is that when you eradicate all the subsidiary structures from people's identity, you turn them into slaves and you turn the ruler into a tyrant. And that's the danger of organizations like the WEF or the UN or the EU for that matter, right? That push this, this identity that's too extreme. There's no intermediary social institutions. There's only individuals and the, the king, the pharaoh, the tyrant. And then you end up with this slave-tyrant dichotomy and everyone is lost and aimless and without identity. And so you are, I think your point that what you're doing with these intermediary structures, nuclear family, a constitutional republic, um, and a national identity is 
flesh, it's not so much a substitute for the orientation towards the divine, it's the fleshing out of what that would mean yes. practically in how you constitute yourself as an individual. This is what the conservatives have to offer in part, right? Because the atomized liberals tend to think of everybody as only individual. But when you start to understand that your identity is also that of the nuclear family and also that of the nation, let's say, and the state, then that gives you a place and a set of tasks to undertake that, that are nested underneath the transcendent, but also meaningful manifestations of identity. 